damn it, how long have we been doing this show? The Wrestling Life. Hey everybody, it's The Wrestling Life, it's episode 386, we're in the final week of September of 2024, I'm Ethan. And I'm Liam. Liam, we have so much to talk about this week. And as always, so many things we can't talk about on the first and only wrestling podcast. WWE is on the road to bad blood, AEW had Grand Slam this week. And on they're on the road to the Wrestle Dream pay per view the following week. NXT is going to premiere on the CW next week, uh, and uh, a pretty big Vince McMahon documentary series dropped this week. I've only seen the first episode, but uh, Brother Liam here has seen more, and that's. Pr- Probably the most interesting thing. Uh, and it's probably the thing that has the most buzz this week. So let's just start with the Vince McMahon. The Mr. McMahon docuseries on Netflix. This Bill Simmons executive produced series where they got access to Vince McMahon and the inner circle and Linda McMahon's all over this thing. Uh, being somewhat truthful. <laughs> and... Uh, telling stories from the old days and uh yeah uh your impressions of the mr mcmahon doc after uh how much have you seen uh what do you think of it so far and um afterwards i'll uh i'll ask follow-up questions sure so uh, as far as how much i've seen i watched the first two episodes in full uh, and then I watched, I skipped ahead to the final episode, which is where they actually uh, begin to discuss. It's a combination Benoit and and sex scandal episode with brief, uh, a little bit on Shane and a little bit on the Undertaker streak thrown in for good measure. Um, I did not get through the entire uh, scandal part of it before we had to start recording here. Um, but um <sighs> As far as what I think of it, I think if you're if you're people like us, if you're listening to this show, I don't know that you're going to learn a lot from it. Um, it's a you know a pretty sequential retelling of the Vince McMahon story, um, for the most part. There's an episode, you know, it goes from the him getting into the business with his father. Uh, buying the company quote unquote from his dad and you know taking it national and hulkamania and then get into the 90s with the steroids and uh the steroid trial and then you do the attitude era episode and and whatever else from there uh, the screw job episode you know all, all, all that good stuff so uh that's those are the middle episodes that i skipped uh because i i can't the second eric bischoff shows up in the second episode i hated this thing like 80% more. I just, <laughs> oh hate, man, hate that motherfucker. Um, that's too strong. I should calm er- down. Eric's uh, my guy. What the hell are you doing? <laughs> just hate him. Just hate him. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, <laughs> but with that in mind, I think if your concern as a, as someone who is very in the weeds on wrestling is that they go too easy on Vince. I don't get that sense from what I've watched. I think they're pretty regulated. There's things like during the Benoit section, uh, they don't point out that like they almost, there's at least some reporting that suggests they knew before they went on the air that things were not what the initial, like that they shouldn't probably do a three hour tribute to the man. Um, Right. So That's, they don't talk uh, about that. They don't talk about that. They have Brian Gerwitz on there saying we found out midway through the show. So, well, wow. so, who's gonna lie? Who's right. gonna lie? Definitely <laughs> right. not Brian Gerwitz. Oh no, honest man. Dwayne did not hold that documentary hostage for four months. That's for sure. <laughs> Brian sure. told us. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think there's there's pit there's bits of the story that I think they should have focused in more on. Um. 
but also I, I try to understand, I also try to come at it from the idea that like this was a mass produced product by the biggest streaming service in the world. And obviously they are making a his, they're making a history of WWE or history of pro wrestling documentary as much as a Vince documentary to get you up to speed on everything. So they want to hit all the big tentpole characters and things like that. So I understand why it's probably not as in depth or doesn't go into as much detail in some parts, but then there's big glaring things like that where I'm like, I think you let him off the hook a little too easy there. Um, uh, you know, they cover the ring boy scandal in part two, I believe uh, they talk about uh, what <laughs> there is the disputed claims of Pat Patterson's involvement in said scandal. Um Patterson Innocence. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Uh, coming soon to NXT. Patterson Innocence. But um, so they, you know, they cover, they don't shot. I couldn't think of like a single big Vince story that they didn't, as far as the scandal side of wrestling, they talk about the Snuka murder. Interesting. Uh, or I'm sorry, alleged murder. Um, he's dead. Is he going to sue me? Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, so they, you know, they touch on most of they, you know, they talk about Rita Chatterton. Um, so I think they, there isn't really, there wasn't like a big glaring omission from what I've watched. Admittedly, I didn't want, like I said, I didn't watch the Montreal episode. I didn't watch the Monday Night Wars episode. So there, there might be some, some glaring omissions in there, but um, I don't know. I feel like for a mass produced documentary about, Vince McMahon that they think maybe non wrestling fans will watch. I think it's fine. <laughs> I see. You um, the thing that struck me while watching is like I don't know who this is for. Yeah. Um, uh, if it's for diehard wrestling people like you and myself, then this is a little. Then you're really not going to tell us anything that we don't know. And if it's for the the people, the public, uh, do they care? Uh, I don't know. Uh, it's a that, delicate. Yeah, I don't know. That is kind of, I think, a recurring theme, especially in episode two, when they talk about the Ring Boy scandal and the steroid trial. And then again, in episode t- six, when they talk about Benoit, they have they do have Phil Mushnick interviewed for this thing. Um, nice. And he's. Uh, has not changed his opinion of Vince McMahon or wrestling or wrestling fans in the last uh, 30 some years. Good. So, um, you know, there's a lot of points where they cut to Dave Meltzer uh, saying that the reason that this wasn't investigated more is because it's wrestling and quote unquote, real reporters don't want to waste their time on the fake stuff on this fake circus. So Vince got away with a lot of things that guys in other industries couldn't do because he was in wrestling so um, that seems to be like one of the recurring themes as far as like, yeah, people just don't pay attention to wrestling. They pay like the way they pay attention to other entertainment industries or sports. Yeah. Yeah. Well, pos- uh, positives. Um, they did interview absolutely everyone. Um. I think Hulk Hogan's the first uh, first person that speaks on this thing. And um, yeah, they interviewed everybody. Prop eight, interesting. Interesting. Uh, a problem I have is just the second Tony Atlas pops up, you lose all credibility. <laughs> yeah, there's there are moments where it feels like he is uh, giving answers that he knows will increase the amount of time he will be on screen in this documentary, I will say. Yeah, it's the darndest thing. Yeah. Um, no, go ahead. Yeah, I, I mean, that's I think pretty much, I think the big glaring omission is Jim Ross. I don't know that there's anybody else that I would have needed. I don't think there's anyone that would have been employed with AEW while this was coming out that uh or while it was being filmed, I guess technically with maybe the exception of maybe Cody was still in AEW when this thing first started filming, but uh, everybody else, 
there's there's nearly nobody from the that is currently or would have been with AEW during the time that is interviewed for this. I don't know if that was a conscious decision or a condition of WWE being so open with their involvement in this. Um, but that's that to me, that's the only big omission is that if you're going to talk about the Attitude Era and you're not going to have one of Vince's right hand guys there seems kind of insane to me. That's more than fair. Uh, you, I mean, we've seen enough Jim Ross talking head on these documentaries, though. Jim Ross is not going to uh, say anything politically uh, unwise. Sure. Um, yeah, I don't know. All right. Well, that's a uh, perspective on the Vince McMahon, the Mr. McMahon docuseries that dropped on Netflix this week. And, um, We'll have to convene back here after you've seen the rest of it. And I've seen uh, more than one episode of it. So there you go. Uh, WWE's on the road to bad blood, as mentioned. They have, let's see, there are five matches, I think, official for this show. And then there is a Sami Zayn and uh, Gunther world title match that... Um, they continue to tease, but have yet not yet announced. So that'll be interesting. Uh, we have Cody and Roman teaming up on this show against Solisco and Jacob at two. What did you think of the uh, cinematic way that uh, they got Cody <laughs> Rhodes and Roman Reigns on the same page for this? Um, what 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 couldn't we just had them do the Mega Powers handshake? <laughs> well. Yeah, Could, couldn't the the uh, the bloodline have just grabbed Vin, uh, Roman's arms and been prepared to hit him with a big guitar, and then Cody runs down and saves him, and then they do a big handshake. Um, I don't know. It's fine. It's what a certain subset of present day wrestling fans want. So, um, you know, it's it was fun. I didn't. It didn't need to be nine minutes long either. I think maybe like a three and a half minute cut of that is maybe good sure um the setting is unique uh you know it was it was slick it was fun i think it's a, a borash production so it, i it, it's it's not for me but it didn't like overly offend me other than being maybe too long but guess what that's a <laughs> that's a complaint i have about most things involving wrestling uh so that's not exclusive to this segment what did you think um yeah, it was okay. <laughs> like, I, I, we think very similarly, so it's difficult to come up with uh, something unique to say. But I'll say, um, uh, I thought, oh, this is very uh, the Avengers, even though I haven't seen most of those Marvel movies. Like, uh, this is trying to appeal to uh, people that watch the Avengers, and um, here we are. <laughs> I don't know. I don't have a lot to add. Uh, <laughs> I think it's really cool that Cody and Roman are going to team up. Roman is doing like uh, six TV tapings between now and uh, Survivor Series. So I assume that we're getting that War Games match on that show. And uh, nice to see Roman get out of the house. So that's cool. Um, also scheduled for the show, Nia Jax versus the winner of a Bailey and Naomi match. Set for this week's SmackDown. CM Punk and Drew McIntyre, Hell in a Cell. Damian Priest versus Finn Balor. And Lynn Morgan versus Rhea Ripley with dirty Dominic Mysterio suspended in a, in a shark cage above the ring. Uh, the old shark cage giving. Nice. <laughs> uh, and then, as as mentioned, uh, we expect that Sami Zayn and uh, Gunther are going to uh, have a world heavyweight title match on this show. Um, and on Raw this week, Jey Uso beat Braun Breaker to win the Intercontinental Championship. Braun Breaker's Intercontinental title reign, which was delayed once because mm -hmm. they wanted him to win it on a big show, uh -huh. is over. Is over after like fifty-one days. Uh, to the Yeet Man, the guy who says Yeet. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know, man. Braun Breaker. Uh. 
we can uh, argue about his promo or discuss his promo ability. Maybe I don't know. Uh, upper mid card is the floor for Braun Breaker, and uh, mm-hmm. face of the company is the ceiling. And Jey Uso is the Yeet Man. <laughs> I just, I know he sells a lot of merchandise. He's very, very popular. It seemed like it was very uh, meaningful for him to win the Intercontinental Championship on Raw. It's just yeah. uh, Jey Uso as a single does nothing for me. <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> uh, but very, ha- very happy for him, though. Sure. Do you have thoughts on him winning the Intercontinental title? Yep. Nice guy. Good family man. Um, yeah, I look, there, I think there's a reason. Like, you know, the New Age Outlaws sold a lot of merch, too, um, but neither Billy Gunn nor uh, Road Dog were particularly <laughs> successful as singles wrestlers um so. they they should still be working the opening match to this day like enzo and cass. <laughs> like enzo and cass yeah and when they had that little run in like 2013 uh i was a big fan of the the outlaws still yep thought they still worked great and the act was still mega over yep um so yeah i uh jay is better would be better served being in the tag team with his brother <laughs> as would Jimmy. Um, but yeah, he's very popular. Um, so I can understand wanting to give him a reward and it's, it's the intercontinental championship. So fine. Uh, right. If, if I would say if the plan is now you build Braun up for something else, either for to challenge Cody for his title or Gunther for his title or something. Great. You got the title off of him. You, you know, you gave a, the baby face guy who's been over for a long time, a nice big win. And in the meantime, and now you can move that guy out of the mid card and move him up. Great. If they're doing that and then they're just going to like do rematches and bronze and bronze just going to be hanging around, then I will probably get more angry about it as we go here. But I, I do just think in general, he is a Steiner. Paul Levesque is in charge of the company. Not his type of guy, maybe a little bit. So he might be a little bit of a square peg in a round hole. He doesn't wear enough leather or chains or uh, maybe listen to enough heavy metal for Paul's liking. So um, I don't know. I feel like there's there is evidence that his ceiling will be lower than it probably should be. Uh while while there but it's still very early on he's still very young and that could all change so like i said i'm, I'm hoping that they're you know we, they give him the loss there to then build him back up for something better but we will see uh this pay-per-view we're still at the end of uh we're still doing build fallout from the end of the judgment day the original judgment day so we have Liv versus Rhea fine we have Damien versus Finn fine I expect that that the crowd is going to be like a mausoleum during Damien versus Finn though for some reason I just (laughs) yeah that does seem like the weak point because you're carving out I think people care about Damien and Rhea versus the judgment day yeah, and they care about Rhea versus Liv with Dom. Yeah, I think if you carve out just Finn, a guy who hasn't been pushed in at a serious level in several years, and uh, and Damian Priest, who is tall, um, I don't, I don't, yeah, it sounds like that's going to be the uh, the bathroom break match on this show, perhaps. And uh, what do you think if uh, they've been doing this kind of one week on, one week off with Punk and Drew for this Hell in a Cell build? Uh, any thoughts on uh, on that? I mean, I, like, what else are they going to do to each other physically, you know? like. Uh, so I guess it's fine. Like I said, I think this peaked like 10 weeks ago. So it doesn't do a lot for me, but I think keeping them apart for the remainder of the build is probably the way to do it or at least not have them have physicality uh, until the pay-per-view because we've kind of seen it all. So um, yeah, let's good luck to them again. Uh, we, you know, we've gotten little Cody got the bleed a little bit in his cage match the other week on SmackDown. 
So maybe they'll get to do a little you know, punk bled a little bit in the strap match. So maybe you get to do a little bit of slightly, you know, PG 13 violence in this one, but I, I don't know. I don't know what to expect. Uh, been a while since punks had a good match, uh, but they'll get to use weapons and things. So maybe this will be uh, better than their previous encounters. All right, uh, NXT debuts on the CW this uh, this week upcoming. They've loaded up the show. Uh, CM Punk's going to be there. He's the guest referee for Ethan Page versus Trick Williams for the NXT Championship. Uh, Julia challenges Roxanne Perez for the NXT Women's Championship. And uh, yeah, so there's uh, that's the uh, the CW premiere. They uh, they kept that one in the Allstate Arena in Chicago, so tickets must have sold well. The following week, they're also on the road in St. Louis, and they moved from the big building to a small building. So <laughs> I assume with Randall, huh? Yeah, yeah. So uh, hey, uh, we know that this probably isn't a viable touring brand, uh, which is why they f- they film in one location. But I'm totally fine with. Uh, experimenting and uh seeing seeing if we can sell tickets once in a while yeah i mean even like doing it i don't know a wwe produced show on the road in like smaller venues could be really fun like and different yeah uh, you know if even if they yeah if they start going to 1200 seat arenas or 15 or 3500 or whatever seat seat arenas instead of the uh you know the big ones like you know like a lot of dynamites and collisions run out of these days yeah um they could uh you know that could still be fun um so yeah we'll we'll see but the first show they did also i saw uh they're implying that stephanie vicar will be there uh to to face the winner of the the women's match yeah countdown to the punk gym selfie is on uh also yeah <laughs> yes Alrighty, well, uh, that's uh, WWE World. Let's head on to uh, AEW here. They had Dynamite Grand Slam this week. They taped Collision Grand Slam. Uh, this week's Rampage was taped last week. <laughs> anyway, the big matches on uh, Dynamite Grand Slam were John Moxley versus Darby Allen with Darby Allen's <laughs> guaranteed title shot up for grabs for some reason. And uh, Moxley won, and Moxley wins the title shot. <laughs> so it's Moxley versus Brian Danielson for the AEW World Title in uh, Tacoma, Washington, on October twelfth. Moxley was uh, off the board, took himself off the board for a while there, and then uh, came back with a new gimmick. And uh, suddenly he is uh, probably getting Brian Danielson's final match instead of Darby Allen. It's interesting. Um, I think it's it's a bigger match. I think John Moxley and Brian Danielson is a bigger match. Sure. I I just think that uh, it's funny sometimes how uh, John Moxley is low key the most political guy in AEW. Yeah, he has his uh, he has his moments. <laughs> Um, I always think back to the when we were in the midst of the punk uh, uh, second comeback. The from, brouhaha, if I can invoke a little French, please do. Uh, yeah, when and when Moxley went on Renee's podcast after uh, Punk went on his Instagram <laughs> stories and complained about how Moxley didn't want a job to him. Right, funniest man in the world. Um, <laughs> Uh, and Mox and Moxie is just like, uh, there's a lot of BS here. I could have walked onto SummerSlam with the AEW title if I wanted to. Like, and I yeah. was like, yeah, yeah, you really could have. Uh, that's just the fact that he said it, and he's like, he's like, I wouldn't, but I could have, and I would have been mm-hmm. legally within my rights to do that. I'm like, well, I don't know about holding the belt because there's there's been some lawsuits about that over the years. Right. But he could have walked onto SummerSlam while still being the reigning AEW champion. That is right. undoubtedly true. Very much so. Yeah. So I just, I always think about that in the back of my mind, where he's like, I feel like he is always, he's more vocal than I think people might think. 
his persona is easygoing guy who just is happy to be there and loves wrestling, mm -hmm. which he is and he does. However, he's he's smart and clever. He's smart and clever also. Right. And it's like <laughs> I believe he is really easygoing and will do whatever when he's working like revolver in front of 300 people. <laughs> you know sure sure or you know the pacific northwest west indies that he that he works or whatever yeah i i think he, he's probably a very easygoing guy that when it comes to like tv wrestling national tv wrestling i think he i think he cares a little bit more <laughs> but yeah um as far as yeah we i mean i think we talked about it leading up to it um you've you've really kind of cucked darby on this um <laughs> by having him put his title shot on the line that he won like three months ago and then losing it. And also the fact that he put his title shot on the line on the show where he was supposed to wrestle for the championship while the champion wrestled someone else. Um, that messiness, I still think was never accurately explained. <laughs> um, Not but... just, just say one sentence to make it make sense. That's mm -hmm. all I'm asking. It's I mean, so you just had Darby say, you know what? I don't even I don't care if Danielson's back. I want to fight Mock first and I'm going to put the title and I'm going to put the title shot on the line. Like, OK. Like, yeah. OK, that's all you have to say. Yes. Like, it's still weird from a booking perspective to announce Darby's getting a shot at Grand Slam and then not do it. But at least have the characters on like make make up a reason. <laughs> Like, yes, the, the real life reason could just be we changed our mind. We want to do a different match. That's fine. Indubitably. But you need to you need within the context of the fictional show, make it make it make sense. Um, But they didn't. But hey, like I mean, I liked I liked the match. It was like a they did their version of like Brock versus John Cena. And uh, Moxley threw him around and brutalized him. And Darby fought and fought and then was finally killed. So, yeah, I, I think at the end of this, yes, Moxley being the guy to kill Danielson and send him home. Uh, theoretically, that makes him a really big heel. And then the person, maybe it's even Darby that beats Mox in six months or whatever, will uh, in turn also be a bigger star from that. Would Would it matter if Darby does it this way versus if he just went and wrestled Brian Danielson and beat Brian Danielson in a babyface match. I don't know. <laughs> I yeah. don't know if it matters. I think Darby Allen's kind of the level of star Darby Allen's going to be. Um, so, and again, it could be anybody it doesn't have to be Darby Allen, but I, yeah, I don't know. It's fine that they're doing this. I just wish they would have uh, done a better job <laughs> is really what I keep coming back to. But um, you know, the ending, the ending angle with the, uh, I thought it was cute with, Danielson rebutting the uh, plastic bag suffocation by uh, by choking Moxley with a necktie was great. Yeah. And also him being the first guy to just not sell for Marina was also fun. Yes. Um, he's like, nope, not doing it because I can't hit you back. So I'm not going to just stand here and get wailed on. <laughs> uh, I thought that was fun. Uh, but yeah, that is that... that is a problem when you have a lady heater. Correct. She either has to always hit the person from behind or otherwise the guy just has to stand there and not fight back while she's beating his ass. Yeah. Yeah, it's tough. Um, but anyway, I thought, I, you know, the ending of the show felt hot. It's a, it's a big match. feels like a big grudge match. So that's all fine and good. Um, but yes, the roundabout way in which we went to get there. And also, what do you what do you do with Darby now that he's been uh, so thoroughly uh, cucked is, is probably a question worth ac asking as well. So, you know, let's hope there's a, a long-term plan in, in place to, uh, to build that guy back up after he was, you know, indirectly or directly cheated out of his title match and then lost clean. Yeah. 48-year-old um, Nigel McGuinness made a rare in-ring appearance on this show. He wrestled Danielson almost 15 years to the day since their last match. We talked about this a lot uh, last week. But uh, they advertised this in a very strange way. They delivered it in a very strange way. 
Uh, but uh, there you go. Nine Double Guinness and Brian Danielson, one more time. What did you think? I liked it. Um, they're older. <laughs> they're two older gentlemen now. They and, certainly are. Uh, you know, it was a very, uh, I thought it was pretty safe. Nobody headbutted a ring post. Um, they teased it the one time, but they didn't actually do it. Um, they did. I thought they did some fun, innovative stuff. The thing where the old rivals wrestle. And so there's like 800 times where they go for their signature thing and the other guy counters it. And then finally they hit it late in the match. I think is always those types of matches are fun. Um, so I thought it was put together. Well, um, you got the big entrances, Tony, Tony sprang for Oasis and, uh, Europe. So you yeah. got the big uh the big uh licensed music entrances. So um yeah, I think it was as good it was as it was going to be given uh Nigel's lack of ring time over the last 20 years. And uh and uh, yeah, so I thought I thought it was fun. I'm glad they got to do it. I'm sure it meant a lot to both of them personally. Um it's well documented how you know you know, Nigel, Nigel's problems and, and all of that, that kind of ran him out of wrestling, not ran him out or not, that kept him from continuing on wrestling uh, full time are well documented. So it's nice that he got to have this moment with, I think, the person that people would consider his greatest opponent, certainly. So um, and with Danielson about to hang it up, this was one of the last dates where I guess they could. And as you mentioned, it also had the symmetry of being. Uh, you know, right around the anniversary of their last meeting. So it was fun. I'm glad they did it. I agree that the, the, the way to get there was not good. And, you know, Nigel, because Danielson was off TV uh, selling the, the beat down for Moxley, Nigel also had to do the build all by himself. So, um, you know, maybe you would have been nice to have like in a perfect world where things where the booking made more sense, where, Danielson could have done one interview <laughs> leading up to this, but uh, what they did, all things considered, it led to a very nice moment and the crowd went crazy for it. I think that's the first time uh, like a full audience or a nearly full audience has ever done the you're going to get your effing head kicked in chant Likely audibly on, so. on television. So, you know, that was a, that was a fun, a fun, funny moment, I thought. So, yeah, it was fun. I thought the, the, the build to it was dumb, but it was a bucket list item item check thing for Danielson's last year as a as a full timer. All right, Dave. T- uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, Mariah May uh, retained her women's title on that show, and um, uh, I don't know. Did anyone buy you Kazakazaki was going to beat her? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. But um, they're. Uh, they're just doing some uh, some Mina Shirakawa stuff there. Uh, Britt Baker returns to the ring next week against Sharia Deeb. Um, not really clear to me what we're doing with the women's title picture there until, um, yeah, until Tony Storm and uh, until we run it back with Tony and Mariah too. I don't know what we're doing yeah. here, but I mean they they had so after Yuka lost, they had Willow come out who was coming off of the loss right. to challenge to seemingly challenge Mariah. And then uh, Mina Sharikawa came out and Mariah attacked Willow. So it seems like they're setting up a tag match between uh, there with Mina being conflicted because she's also teaming with Tony in stardom coming up here soon. Right. So I guess the idea we're going to eventually get to Mariah, Tony two with, whose side is uh, Mina on as the uh, de- determining factor of the match, I assume. But uh, until then, she's wrestling a lot of cold opponents on TV. You know, they had to wrestle Nyla Rose. They had to wrestle uh, Yuka. They've had her mix it up with like Queen M and Nada. Uh, all fine performers. Uh, none of them uh, that the crowds believe have a snowball's chance of beating uh, Mariah for the title. Right. Yep. So there's that. Uh, Ricochet and Will Ospreay on TV next week. Um, Will Ospreay and Kyle Fletcher uh, lost to the Young Bucks at uh, at Grand Slam. Uh, 
And now uh, Will's back to just uh, being in one program at a time, maybe. <laughs> yes, he he would not allow Kyle to, to cheat, and therefore they lost. And so I assume the that Horseman beatdown they've been teasing for eleven years now, with the the Callis family uh, beating up Will. I assume is coming here soon. But uh, match, match with the Bucks is really good. Best Bucks match non Sting and Darby division in a long time. So uh, they they heard me talking about how they're washed and uh, they were they were not mad about it. But they did have a very good match with two of the best PWG style guys in the company. So they they showed out for this one. All right. Uh, anything standing out to you uh, about the collision taping for this weekend? We got Okada and Sammy Guevara in a continental title in Eliminator. Woo. <laughs> we have uh, Claudio Pac and Wheeler Utah defending their World Trios titles in an open challenge. We have Hologram, The Beast, Mortos, and Drillistico in a three way. Hangman Page and Jeff Jarrett in a strap, Lumberjack strap match. Yeah. <laughs> Jamie Hater against Soraya in a Soraya's Rules match. A Tornado Trios match. Chris Jericho, Big Bill, Brian Keith against Orange Cassidy, Kyle O'Reilly, and Mark Briscoe. Uh, Brody King against Action Andretti. Jack Perry against a mystery opponent. Uh, there you go. Anything stand out to you from the collision taping? Um, Not, not a lot. Uh, I, they're, I guess they're, they didn't really further they did i guess this is spoilers if anyone cares yeah. about collision yeah. spoilers yeah they did the trios championship match yuda won the match for his team but they didn't they didn't really pull the trigger on is he with them or not so if you were hoping for like storyline advancement it doesn't seem like they're doing a lot i guess Roosh yeah. is gonna getting a new stable out of, of some of the lucha guys again 800th stable for Roosh. yeah That's right uh, maybe I didn't, um, uh, it seems like maybe there is a little Yuta advancement in, in one of the notes that I saw from it's, oh, okay. um, he, um, yeah, spoilers. He, uh, he refuses to let go of a submission after the match and, uh, and keeps, keeps, uh, keeps the submission on for a really long time on the baby faces. So I don't know. Maybe it's, it doesn't seem like the big, exclamation point to your point it's not the big oh he's definitely only a heel now right. but it's more than uh oh he's uh he's uh, impotently crying in the ring <laughs> <laughs> good news less crying for you to probably better um yeah, yeah, yeah. And i guess the only thing i'll mention you mentioned soraya and uh and uh, jamie hater Jamie Hader have a match on that show. Uh, just announced right as we were about to record, Soraya's re-signed with the company, apparently. Oh, Lord. So if you thought maybe the match result there was a sign that Soraya was finishing up, nope. <laughs> well, there you go. I just... What? <laughs> like, AEW Women's Division, by and large, has taken a lot of strides in the last you know year or so. I would say, I think that's fair to say. Uh, I don't know what value Soraya brings to any company besides the World Wrestling Federation because they can market her as a pioneer of the capital W women's capital E evolution uh, for for documentaries and uh, merchandise. Uh, so I don't I don't really know what she, what what's having Soraya. The, does does for your women's division if you're AEW, but hey, that's fine. She's getting paid. Good for her. She got paid. She got a brother signed. Yep. <laughs> it's it, it's it's unbelievable. What happened to that well, guy? <laughs> yeah, I don't know, man. He's been I walking around his little hat and vest. Ugh. <laughs> it's just the one. It's the Soraya Cinematic University in AEW. Leaves a fair amount to be desired. There is Harley Cameron running around being funny, though. Yeah. So there's that. I say, it's a fine, like, sea show act, I guess. If that's what you want. <laughs> I, 
But are you paying your C Show Act money to be with your company, you know? My guess is yeah. I don't know though. Well, I guess I probably have to write about Soraya now. So <laughs> let's get out of here. Um yeah, till next time everybody. Uh I'm Ethan. And I'm Ian. We'll be back soon with more stories from the wrestling life. Bye bye. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. Now, here are this week's bonus features. The Baltimore Orioles are likely somehow to host a best-of-three playoff series beginning next week. Most likely scenarios we host Detroit or Kansas City. Detroit, who we just lost uh, four, <laughs> six games to in the last two weeks. Yeah. I don't remember what happened against Kansas City this season, but it doesn't matter. Right. Because, again, the, the Orioles team that may have beaten, even if they went 6 and 0 against them, uh, it's not the. Same team that we'll be playing in uh, a few days here. But hey, trending in the right direction. Like, I was trying to think of like, well, Rangers and Diamondbacks last year both limped in. Yes. So watch this be the team that like makes the World Series and then loses in four games. Like, Sure, why not? Like this team that I mostly have grown to dislike a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me. Had a million injuries. True. Yeah, it's it's hard to get like two. That's the that's the other part that complicates. I feel like your feelings of getting a feel. Yeah. It's like if you look in the previous era that the Orioles were good, and by era I mean three out of like the eight years that Buck Showalter managed here. Yeah. Uh, it's like okay, the the years where they didn't go to the playoffs, it was kind of easy to spot almost immediately that they were going to be mediocre. Uh, I don't remember any of those teams having like a really hot start and being in first place, uh, you know, at the all-star break and then just waffling like this, but they also weren't injured the way that this team was to your point. I don't know. (laughs) Birch Smith is gone. Eloy Jimenez (laughs) is gone. A lot of the, the poverty Poverty Orioles of this year are gone, and a lot of their bats, at least, are are back healthy, allegedly. Uh, so, you know, you get them in there. We'll see what happens. Sure, why not? Well, uh, Texas showed us last year. All you have to do is get the bats hot, uh, get five innings out of your starting pitcher, Mm-hmm. And then find three relief pitchers and only pitch those three relievers. <laughs> yeah, if you can <laughs> kind of they piece, had... piece everything together with that. Yeah, they had like um Josh Spores, mm-hmm. uh Ar- Chapman, and um uh a Dominican fellow whose name I can't recall. Anyway, those are the only three, uh, only three relief pitchers they threw all postseason. All right, this is fascinating. <laughs> I was going to ask as a trivia note. Uh, yeah. So Gunnar Henderson, shortstop for the Orioles, only uh, only the fourth player in team history with thirty home runs and twenty stolen bases. Can you name the other three? Uh, Brady Anderson, Cedric Mullins. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, 30 homers. Rec- it is a more recent, like in our lifetime player. Oh, 30 homers and 20 steals. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's such a rare combination mm-hmm. of power and speed. <laughs> I'm stalling. Uh, I can't. Rec- I, I don't know. Manuel Machado. See, I forget that he used to run a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's the thing. I think of by the time he was hitting 30 plus home runs of the the Husky Manny. <laughs> right. We see that we still see today and playing for San Diego, <laughs> you know, big fella.
<laughs> um, and it's like, no, there was a year or two there where he was already hitting into the 30s and still running a little bit. So it's like, oh, what do you know about that? I think of those as like two distinct eras of his career. And it's like, no, there's there's one or two years of overlap before he became exclusively a power guy. <laughs> I see. Well, thank you for uh, educating me there. Mm-hmm. It's just one of those ones where it's like in not in a million years would I have guessed him. I would have gone way, way back to try to figure out if like Boog Powell somehow stole 20 cases <laughs> one year or something or Eddie Murray or somebody. Yeah, I couldn't piece it together. I was going to probably go like Ken Singleton or something. Mm, yeah. <laughs> or like Reggie Jackson the one year he was here or something. Like, Yeah. Yeah. Well, what do you know? Well, hoarding Coke Spice has Coke Spice has begun. <laughs> Coca-Cola has decided to discontinue another of my favorite products. It's this is a war. <laughs> this is a tradition. Uh, orange vanilla Coke was my favorite soda, mm-hmm, and uh, mm-hmm. uh, they discontinued it. Uh, Coca-Cola Energy was my favorite energy drink. They discontinued it. Mm. I lo- I really like this Coca-Cola Spiced, and uh, it was a permanent addition to their flavor lineup. No more. R.I.P. That's a uh, that's a shame. That's that's a that's a tough track record because most of their flavors, as you educated me off the air this week, are, <laughs> are temporary. They're right. like when they do the Oreo Coke Zero. That's just like a little fad they right they they bring out. And if it's popular, maybe they bring it back for another three months next year or whatever. But right. as right. opposed to this Spice Coke, which has been around for a while. Yeah, it's it's, uh, it's very difficult being a middle aged straight white man, but um, somehow I'll get by. And yet, well, I was going to say you could probably do orange vanilla Coke from one of those fancy soda machines at like a you definitely slightly, could slightly higher end uh, uh, fast food place. Yeah, but there's probably no spice flavor in one of those. So. That's well, the one that's really going to elude you over the over the course of the rest of your life. The workaround here is that it uh, it's kind of just raspberry. Oh, and one, of, <laughs> one of the reasons raspberry spiced Coke is what they call it. I see. Uh, uh, and one of the reasons they decided to make it is like in those freestyle Coke machines, raspberry was like chosen five million times one year or something. So they're like, oh, well, we're going to use this to make a new flavor. Uh, <laughs> I don't know why they're just continuing after like six months, but okay. I try to keep on keeping on.